Hey, my name is John Tolo, and I'm an urban missionary. So Godtown is an urban mission training center that has begun to send people all over the world. I'm convinced that good news actually is the answer to every issue that we're dealing with in our culture at this time. My name is Alyssa Adams. I am the high school ministry coordinator here at Chapel Street. So last summer, going to the Twin Cities, we had a lot of students encounter God in ways I don't think they ever had before. I'm CJ Valenti, 10th grade, go to Batavia. Last year, I went to, I chose to go on the mission trip because I feel like it was a great opportunity to, to grow my relationship with God and with some of my closest friends. And even to this day, I feel like the people I met on that mission trip and the people that are in my group are still some of the closest friends that I got. An example of like when I really noticed God working was we were at God's Town. We were doing this thing where we went out and we wrote down a description of a person. When we walked by somebody and if we thought that, that description fit them, then we would just like ask them, talk to them, and just ask to pray for them. And my leader, Tira, wrote down just like, I'm gonna meet a, a construction worker by a van wearing an orange vest. And within the first 30 seconds, we walked by a guy going back to his van, construction worker wearing an, an orange vest, and that just, just like showed me that God's there. So my name is Sarah Hahn, and I am a sophomore at Geneva High School and went on the Twin Cities trip last summer. One of the coolest things was on the ship, like the worship was phenomenal. You just got to worship with all your friends. And just, I think that was another huge way that I saw God's presence on this trip is just everyone was in the same place at the same time um, for a whole week, just spending time like worshiping God. I want to go back to the Twin Cities just because it honestly is the week that where my faith with God started. Like that's kind of where my like story starts. Cause I obviously knew God, like I went to church when I was young. I knew him my whole life, but I never knew what an actual like relationship with, with him was. So going on this trip allowed me to kind of like see that and kind of like practice like kind of living like Jesus and just kind of learning like how to serve others. The thing that I uh, watch over and over again is that they come in and they actually bring the presence of Jesus into an area that may not have a lot of people walking up and down the street that believe in Jesus. A lot of the kids that uh, live in our area are completely unchurched. They've never had any experience um, with going to a church at all. And when they have other peers that come in and share a, a short time of life with them, playing with them, uh, working with them, helping out their families or stuff like that, it has a big impact on them and they get to see that there's something different than what their own experience is. It's a little shocking at first for some of our students who might expect like, oh, I've you know been to Chicago before or any other place that has people that look different than us. But I think going down into Midtown specifically or even um, the neighborhoods in Godtown, there is just such a different demographic where I think it gives our students a chance to really see the face of God in strangers. Definitely serving a community that like you're not used to. We obviously live in like Geneva, the Tri-Cities area. We're not used to like going out into like more diverse communities. So it was definitely like an eye-opening thing to just see where the different like places people are at in their lives. And it was kind of neat because you just kind of entered that and you kind of just went, went in and with like a loving, serving heart and just went in to meet them where they're at. Well, the main reason I want to go back is I grew really close to my friends last year and I feel that I'll, I'll meet new people on the mission trips and those that I am friends with, I can grow even closer with because it is extremely important to have friends around you that love the Lord and just push you to strive close to the Lord every single day. My faith just started just through the whole trip. Just, it like kept building each day. Just seeing like his presence every day. You start your day with a devotional. Like I carried it on into my daily life when I went home. And now every day I will read my Bible before dead. I'll wake up, I'll pray right away. I'll talk to my friends about God. And just the things I've learned on that trip, I took with me and carried home. Many, 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 many years ago, I was a youth pastor here, uh, and some of my best memories are missions trips, not just because of the difference, that, the impact that we made, but m much more so the impact made in our lives. We go to serve and to teach, but it's often we're the ones that are learning, and God is teaching us, and so I love the, CJ is exactly right. It's very, very important to have people around you that love the Lord, 
and can encourage you in your faith. And so if you're, uh, we have students leaving shortly this next week for the Twin Cities and then next, in the next couple weeks for Ecuador. And so if there are any students here uh, or leaders here going on either of those trips, would you stand up? Don't be shy, stand up. Yep, yep. St- now, would, would stay standing, stay standing. Would the, would the parents of these students also stand? If you're here, if any moms and dads are going, yep, okay. Now, let me, moms and dads, let me pray on behalf of, I know, your hearts and all of our hearts for your kids and these leaders as they go to serve. Let's pray. God, thank you for the privilege to serve you here, locally, different parts of this country and around the world. It's, uh, it, you've called us to be servants wherever you send us. So we pray your blessing of protection and provision over these students and leaders, not just physical, but spiritual. As they go to serve, Lord, enable them to make an impact, but much more, Lord, open their hearts and minds to what you wanna show them. Grow their faith. Reveal to them that they are the future of the church, and they are the church right now. And we're excited and blessing them as they go for what they will do and what you will do through them and in them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're wrapping up a series today on Romans chapter 8, the greatest chapter. It feels like uh, I, I, we're going to wrap it up, really. We're just beginning to scratch the surface of this book. If you've read through Romans, I had a friend uh, in, in, in graduate school who memorized all of Romans. I know. I called him or I texted him to see if he could still do it. He said, no way. <laughs> Paul's letter to the Romans uh, has, been, has had a huge impact throughout human history. It'd be impossible to capture it all. A couple of highlights. St. Augustine, heard of him? Converted when he heard a child singing a song, take and read, take and read. He felt it was the voice of God speaking to him, and he opened up the Bible to the book of Romans and began to read. It changed his heart. He said that he felt the, that his heart and mind were suddenly flooded with light as he read the book of Romans, Paul's letter to Romans. Martin Luther famously was converted while reading uh, the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 17, about a righteousness that is revealed by faith from God. And by the way, he was an Augustinian monk. Augustine comes to faith by reading Romans. Martin Luther is an Augustinian monk. And he's, he's as monkish as you can get, trying hard to be you know, a good monk and earn God's favor, be righteous by his effort, and was earning him nothing. And he felt that in his soul, lived in fear of being doomed, uh, that he couldn't be forgiven, that he'd sinned too much. And reading Romans, light broke through, and he got it. I'm saved not by my effort, my monkishness, but by his effort on the cross. John Wesley was converted while reading, hearing Martin Luther's preface to the, letter, to the epistle of the Romans being read. He said his heart was strangely warmed. By the way, he was already a pastor, and he came to saving faith in Jesus after he's a pastor. It made me think, oh, Lord, is there anything you want to say to me? We could go on and on and on. John Bunyan read Romans in a prison cell, and it inspired him to write Pilgrim's Progress. My good friend and John Kelly, who's preached here, talked about reading Romans in his prison cell and coming to faith in Jesus. And we've only really just begun to scratch the surface. The passage we're going to look at today is what I would call one of the awe passages. One of those passages we should return to over and over and over again because it fills our hearts and our minds with a sense of awe and wonder at the power and love of God. And the whole passage really is dealing with one central core issue. Your level of confidence in the love of God for you. When you read through Paul's prayer in the New Testament, this is what he's praying for. He's always praying, not for our circumstances, but for our understanding, our depth of insight, our knowledge, not just objective, but subjective experience of the love of God. That we would know the depth of his love. So I'm gonna ask you a question as we start. How would you rate your level of confidence in God's love for you? How would you rate your level of confidence in God's love for you? One through 10. Now I know you're in church and you're supposed to say 10, but I want you to be brutally honest with yourself. Do you live with a 10 out of 10 assurance, God loves me? Does that that fill and fuel and inform the decisions you make, the way you speak to people? The way you live and move in the world, the way you parent, the way you lead 
the way you work, the way you interact, the way you think and the, the thoughts that don't ever make their way into the daylight of your words. What would you say? What would you give yourself? I often ask men, what do you think God thinks of you? And they often answer something like, well, I know he loves me, but I'm kind of a screw up. He's being patient. I'm trying to get my act together. I'm, no, no, that's what you think of you. What does God think of you? So I'm going to ask you now to give yourself a mental score, one through 10. What's your level of certainty, confidence that God loves you? I'm, I would bet, if we're honest, most of us are not at 10, at least not all the time. We go through seasons and challenges that, and experiences that would cause us to question. If God loves me, why this? Why that? I think it's the most crucial thing in our Christian life is to live at level 10. Or if you know the movie, this one goes to 11. Right? If you don't, don't worry about it. This is precisely what the end of, the book of, of Romans chapter 8 is dealing with. I think Paul's, what we're going to look at is Paul's way of trying to bring us to 10. To assure us. So that it would, it would change the way that we live and move in the world. Let's read the passage in its entirety, then we'll break it down as we go. Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now I'm gonna take a little uh, moment here, and, and if you're a note taker in your Bible, you can do this with me as well. There's a number of who questions. Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Next slide. Who shall separate us? Whoops. Go back one slide. Maybe I can do it. There we go. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And now Paul's assurance statement in the last two verses. For I am sure, confident, convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Like I said, this is one of the awe passages. We should read it and meditate on it and reflect on it over and over and over again because we need it. We need to be assured of it. I don't know who first came up with the, the chant, the sports theme chant, who dat? Have you heard this? But the, the New Orleans Saints popularized it and made it famous. They're the who dat nation. You'll see an image here of the who dat nation. Uh, and the, the chant goes, who dat? Who dat? Say they're going to beat them saints, which is pretty much most teams these days. But anyway, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> and then the answer is nobody. Nobody. Who day? Who dat? I think in a way, the Apostle Paul might agree with me that this is the who dat uh, section of who, who that say they're going to separate the saints of Jesus from the love of Christ? Nobody. I, 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 well, you know, maybe it'll stick in your mind at least. <laughs> the Apostle Paul would agree that, that, that he's challenging us in a way. Take your best shot. What do you think is going to separate you from God's love? Let's go through it together. There are four who questions. I'll just say them quick and then we'll work through them. Who can be against us? Verse 31. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? Verse 33. Who is to condemn? Verse 34. Who shall separate us in the love of Christ? Verse 35. In every case, the answer is nobody. Nothing. No one. It's really four ways of getting at the same core issue. Your level of confidence in God's love for you. Think about the best relationship in your life. Your, the best human relationship you have, your spouse, your husband, your wife, your mom, your dad, your best friend, the, the place where you're most confident, they have my back. 
I can trust them. They love me. I know they love me. Even that relationship, if you pressed it far enough, you could damage it to a point where you might wonder. The best of our human relationships. And we tend to sort of impose that onto God. Okay, I know he loves me. The Bible says so, right? Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. But is he always going to love me? Will his love diminish? What if I screw up again and again and again? What then? Notice that um, Paul, before he gets to the who questions, he asks another setup question. He says, what shall we say then to these things? These things is P Paul talking about everything that he's said up to this point in all of Romans. But let's just take a minute and look at these things in just chapter 8 where we've been in this series. What are these things? Paul says, okay, let's, let's sum it up. Let's bring it to a head. What are we going to say about all this? What are these things? You'll see here on the screen some of these things. No condemnation, verse one. Set free by the spirit of life, verse two. The spirit dwells in us, adopted as sons and daughters, heirs with Christ. Our suffering makes sense. The groaning that we have is put in context. Saved into an eternal hope. The spirit intercedes for us. God's working all things out for us. Pastor Joe preached about this, verse 28, last week. For his good purpose. And conforming us to the image of his son. What do we say about all this? What do we say to these things? This is just chapter eight. Paul is referring to the amazing truths that he's been writing about. It's overwhelming. What shall we say to these things? Well, here's a good summary, Paul says. God is for us. Paul says, you, I mean, you want me to sum it up for you? All this, no condemnation, the indwelling of the Spirit, adopted sons and daughters, heirs with Christ, conforming you to the image of his Son, all things working together for good. If you get nothing else, know this, God's for you. He's for you. If you're in Christ, God is for you. He's not against you. He's not indifferent. He's not neutral. He is working for you. Always. 24-7, 365. Do you believe that? Not just intellectually. Do you believe that? Lots of religions and people say and claim God's on our side. And sometimes they use God's for us or God's on our side to justify horrible things. But just because the phrase is abused doesn't mean we shouldn't have confidence in it because Paul tells us how we can have that confidence. I wonder how many of us could benefit from the simple truth, God's for me. How quick we are to doubt that. You know what I notice about my own life and many of us is that we live with this, we don't admit it, but deep down we wonder if it's true and we suspect that he's not actually really for us. He doesn't really love us. And then when hard things happen in our lives, we use that as evidence to confirm our deep suspicion that God doesn't love us, right? Something goes wrong. See, I knew it. God doesn't love me. But we've already convinced ourselves that's true. Paul's saying something very different for us in this passage. We tend to evaluate um, God's love based on our circumstances. This whole section is saying, no, no, no. You evaluate your circumstances in light of the fact that God loves you and is for you. There's all the difference in the world between those two things. So the question then is, if it's true that God is for us, and it is, who can be against us? This is the first who question. Who can be against us? Who that say they're going to be against us? <laughs> How do we know God is for us? Is this just wishful thinking? Is this Christian positive self-talk that we just say to ourselves? How can we be sure that God is for us? And who is it that's against us? Let's look at verses 31 to 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Here's Paul's answer. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You might not see it immediately. This is profound, practical wisdom for your everyday life. 
What does the cross of Jesus Christ have to do with your sense of being loved every day? Paul says, everything. We, we, we tend to think like this. Yeah, I know God loves me, but I've got this issue. But the economy, but I'm not sure how I'm going to make it. But this situation with my family, but this relationship. Paul's saying, if God did the cross, if he did the big thing, Calvary, dying for you, you can trust him to do the little thing that you're worried about. He's working from the greater to the lesser here. He sent his son to die for you. He did not spare his own son. You can trust him with whatever you're facing. The cross is your present reminder that God is always working for you. It's not just something way in the past that happened once upon a time. It's evidence. God, this is how you know God is for you. If he did that. Like imagine, imagine you, uh, dad's in here, grandfather's in here. You decide you're going to take your family on a trip. Hawaii. Well, that seems ridiculous. Some of you could do it, but most of you are like, nope. Okay, the Grand Canyon. You're going to fly your, your family there. You're going to pay for the hotel. You're going to go rafting on the Colorado River. You've invested thousands in, in this. You've planned it for months. Everybody's excited. You all make it there, and you're in a car driving to get there, and you see parking 20 bucks, and you go, no way am I paying that. We're canceling this trip, right? Your wife would be like, you are parking, right? <laughs> like, what? You're pot committed. We are already too invested. We're doing this. That's what Paul's saying like about the cross. I already did it. Like the great, your biggest problem is solved. I said, my son, don't stress about this little thing. I got you. Now, when he says graciously give us all things, uh, he doesn't mean everything you want, everything you desire, all the, all the things that you want to go your way. He means all things necessary to achieve his purpose in your life. This is what Pastor Joe preached last week to us. Everything required for his purpose, his good purpose, to conform you to the image of his son. God's goal for you is that you would glorify him and enjoy him as he shapes you into the image of his son, Jesus, and he will hold back nothing from you to make that happen. That's what all things means. And you know that because of the cross. Second, who shall bring any charge against us? Paul's using legal language here. Who shall bring any charge against us? Look at verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Now, when he says elect, he means those God chose and called. It's another way of looking at what we mean when we say in Christ. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who are in Christ, saved, belong to Jesus, have been called and chosen, therefore are the elect. We could... Parse that out into predestination and foreknowledge. We're not going to do that this morning. Just, just think of it this way. If you're a believer in Jesus, that's you. Who's going to bring a charge against you if you belong to him? He doesn't mean, so. lots of people will bring charges. Our world is constantly talk, telling us why you, your faith and what the Bible teaches is a problem is what's wrong with the world. doesn't mean who's not going to bring a charge. Many will do that. Our culture will do that. The evil one will do that. Your own heart will do that. But who's going to make them stick? Who's going to bring a charge that will stick? Nobody. Look at his answer. It is God who justifies. Could it be simpler? If the judge of the universe says not guilty, then, class, not guilty. If the judge of all creation, the Lord of heaven and earth says, because of my son, she is not guilty. He is not guilty. Then you're not guilty. There's no higher court of appeals. There's nowhere else to go with this. It is God who justifies, and he has justified you in Jesus. 1 John 3, 20, even when our hearts condemn us, and they do sometimes, God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. It is God who justifies. God has justified us, declared us righteous. This means we live in the security of the knowledge that our deepest need has already been met. Every day, you get up tomorrow, justified, forgiven, free, loved, done. The verdict is in. Third question. Who is to condemn us? Who they say they're going to condemn us, right? Who is to condemn the saints of, of God that belong to him? 
Many will try, but who can? Paul isn't saying people will never accuse or charge. The truth is, you align your heart with the teaching of God's will. You align your life with the teaching of God's will. You seek to pursue justice according to the word of God, not according to the standards of our culture. And many will condemn. Many will charge. Many will try to say, you're, you're on the wrong side of history. You're out of bounds. Paul's saying, but who can make that stick ultimately? Nobody. Because the God of the universe has declared you righteous in Christ. Who's going to condemn us? Look at verse 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who's the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So here's Paul's question. Who's going to condemn us? Here's his answer. Not Jesus. Like the only one who could will not. How do we know he will not? He tells you right here. Is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is the right hand of God interceding for us. Jesus died for you. More than that, he was raised from the dead for you. Even more than that, he is right now at the right hand of God interceding for you. He's not condemning you. He'll never condemn you. He received your condemnation in himself on the cross and now stands before the Father interceding for you. Let me ask you this question. How brave and confident and assured would you be in your life if you knew that in the next room, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, was praying for you? How would you behave if you knew in the next room, Jesus is praying for me? He is. Distance is no difference to God. He is interceding for you, always working praying on your behalf for you. Jesus is more committed to you than you are to him. We live with this, I gotta muster up more commitment, I gotta be more committed. I should be a better Christian than I am. Yeah, that's probably true. It's true for me. But he's more committed to you than you are, will ever be to him. And that will never change. He's ultimately committed, 100% committed to you. This is what, why we can say in Romans 8, 1, right? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's how the whole chapter begins. No condemnation. And Paul's reiterating, who's gonna condemn? Remember verse one, nobody. There is no condemnation. You cannot ever be condemned. You are not condemned because of Jesus. So stop condemning yourself. And for many of us, stop condemning those who God has said there's no condemnation for. Last question. By the way, N.T. Wright says above Romans 8.1 and Romans 8.34, this is the foundation of Christian hope and joy. The central truth, no condemnation, is like the bedrock. It's the, it's the foundation on which you build a life to follow Jesus. Last question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And Paul's gonna spend now like three times the amount of verses on this question, which is really, again, all four of these questions are getting at the same central issue, your level of confidence in God's love for you. And he's gonna spend time on this one, and I think there's a reason why. It's because even though we would agree that God loves me, we live with this sense that yes, but I could if I was bad enough, separate myself from God or cause him to walk away from me? No, you can't. Will God ever stop loving me? Is there a limit to his love? That's what Paul's getting at here. And, and when you read through this, it's like, it's like Paul's saying, all right, Christian, doubting, weak-minded, little faith Christian, take your best shot. Tell me what you think can separate you from God's love. Let's go through the list. And Paul's gonna go through the list with us. Look, verses 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. 
know in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8 begins with no condemnation and it ends with no separation. And everything you, we need is sandwiched in between. Paul gives a list of things. He says, first of all, he says, shall tribulation. Tribulation simply means the hardships of life. Life is not easy. Life is difficult. Sometimes in the suburbs with our comfort and ease, we all look pretty good, you know, and we give off the appearances in our lives and on social media that we got it all together. But I know many of you, and it's not true. You're not fake fooling anybody, right? We've all got issues. I've got mine. You've got yours. Life is hard. We face difficulty and challenges. And so tribulation simply means the hardships of life. Physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain, disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement, loss, all of it. Will any of that separate you from God's love? No. Nor will how you respond to it. It cannot. Second, he says, or distress. This is our response. Our reaction, internal reaction to what's going on around us. I don't feel close to God. Okay. He hasn't left you. He never will. Or persecution. This is tribulation specifically because of your faith. There's a difference. Too many of us, I think, in our American context, think that any tribulation is persecution, and it's not. It's not. Life is hard. And it's an equal opportunity hardship. For we all, it's hard for all of us. In fact, for most of us living in the affluent American West of the world, we do not experience anything like the hardships of life that many people other places do. Persecution means precisely because of your faith, you're experiencing pain and hardship. So you don't get a promotion at work. That's not persecution. Might be, you're bad at your job. Might be the boss is an idiot. Might be some combination of the two. Then Paul says, or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. You might think, well, you could put pandemic in there. He's, he's just giving us like a catalog, a list of, of all the things that might happen, could happen. Hungry, tired, cold, vulnerable, sick. None of these things can separate you from God's love. And by the way, this is not academic for Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. Five times I received the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and Paul's middle name was danger. In toil and heart, it, it wasn't. That was a joke. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me and anxiety for all the churches. Like he, Paul, this is not an academic exercise to Paul when he says in Romans eight all these things. He's experienced them, and yet when you read his letters. He's undergirded and filled with this joy and this confidence and this deep, deep assurance of the love of God. I want to be like that. Too often my little boat is it's so, any little water gets in my boat, oh, I begin to question. You like that? Let's go back a couple slides to the Romans 8 uh, passage, 35 to 39, one more. There we go. For your sake we've been killed all day long. Paul says this, and by the way, he's quoting from Psalm 44 here. And let me tell you why. He's quoting from Psalm 44 uh, about sheep to be slaughtered. It sounds a little strange. Psalm 44 is this psalm written about the sufferings of God's people, the children of Israel. How they were the God's chosen children, the children of Israel, God's chosen people, and they suffered. Some of it at their own doing, the rebellion, some of it just happened. His point in quoting this is to say, difficulty, hardship, suffering, persecution is just part of following me. It shouldn't throw you off. It's not to be unexpected. It's always been. 
In fact, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 that it's an evidence we belong to him if we suffer for his name. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. you see, this is part of it. And then he says this, which is shocking. In all these things, in them, Paul is not saying, because of the love of God, you will not experience these things, or God prevents you and protects you from these things. He doesn't say that at all. He says, in the midst of them, we are more than conquerors. How can you be more than a conqueror? Through him who loved us. Notice the past tense. It's a reference to the cross again. Because of what Jesus has done, we are more than conquerors. In the midst of our difficulty, our hardship, our distress, our anxiety, our persecution. This is why Paul, in prison, can sing praises in chains. And when the chains fall off and the doors fly open, his first response isn't, let's get out of here. It's, let's convert the guards. Because he's free inside from the love of Jesus, not by the bars and the chains. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. It's not our courage. It's not our determination. It's not our resolve or our experience that we conquer through. It's through him who loved us. All right, let's go ahead to the last couple of verses, 38 and 39 once more. I know I'm making you guys jump around there. Paul says, for I am sure. This word is 10 plus, right? How sure are you that God loves you? How confident are you in the love of God for you? Paul says, I'm sure, I'm confident. I'm 100% convinced. And he's going to go through here. Philip Melanchthon, by the way, who was a, a contemporary of Martin Luther, demanded that these two verses be read on his deathbed. As he lay dying, he had someone reading this to him, and every time they finished, they'd read it again, read it again. Like, how would you like to go out of this world hearing these words read over you again and again and again? He's driving home the point to leave no doubt, just in case we still don't get it. Let's read it. Let's read it together out loud. Ready? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You should memorize that. I challenge you this summer, commit those two verses to memory. Say them to yourself. Preach that to yourself. Return to that truth over and over and over again. I have this last line. Like he, he's already said, famine, nakedness, danger, persecution, distress, sword. Like nothing can separate us. And in case I missed something, nothing else in all creation. For you skeptics out there, you hard cases. We're still going, yeah, but, yeah, but. Nothing can separate us from his love. So as Christians, we don't merely grit our teeth and get through life. We walk through life with confidence and joy, even when it's hard, because we're sure, because we know. All right, three, three brief things. What difference should this level of confidence make in your life? And then we're gonna to come to the Lord's table to close. If, if you have, if you, were, if you really lived at 10 out of 10, what difference would that make? Number one, let this truth lead you to worship. No condemnation, no separation, let's worship. I love it when I can hear you singing in here, but I don't just mean the songs on Sunday. I mean, live your life in worship to God. Like you just are overwhelmed that he loves you. Matt Caterer, Jenny Caterer, my assistant who's battling cancer, uh, uh, when he came to faith in Christ, I would see him. He used to play bass here on stage uh, years ago, and I would see him, and he would greet me. I'd say, hey, Matt, it's great to have you here leading worship. And he'd go, he loves us, Pastor Jeff. He really loves us. I'm like, right on. <laughs> he does. James K.A. Smith says, to be a human is to be a lover. We love to love things. We love our teams. We love movies. We love books. We love our kids. We love what they do. We, just, we love to love things. Love God. Order your loves right because he loves you with an everlasting, unshakable love. Let all the other loves in your life flow down from that one central confidence. 
Okay, number two, let this truth lift you out of discouragement. There's an epidemic of anxiety and fear and depression and discouragement. Some of it, much of it, it requires treatment and therapy. But for many people, you need to live with this greater confidence of God's love. You need to live with a soul level confidence, lifting you out of discouragement. Christians should be hard to discourage. My, my, my wrestling coach in college used to say, be hard to discourage. I'm like, what? He means it's, wrestling matches are hard. You get discouraged, you wanna quit. As a follower of Jesus, it should be hard to discourage us. Why? Because we know that we're loved by the God of the universe. Three, let this truth motivate you to mission. If it's true, that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, that is not something you keep to yourself. How could you? It's the greatest news in the world. The level to which you know it to be true has direct co connection to your, your desire to share it with others. But if you're not convinced that it's true, then you will be, often, Hesitant, nervous, reticent to share it. Let the love of God fill your heart, move you to worship, lift you out of discouragement and despair, and motivate you to mission in the world. Because it's, what you need most has already been done. He loves you. He really, really loves you. We're gonna to come to his table, which is given to us as a sign, a symbol, a way that we celebrate God's love for us. How do we know that he loves us? This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And the words of Apostle Paul in Romans 8, we just read, he who did not spare his own son, how will he not also graciously give us all things? So he invites us to his table through the simple elements of bread and cup to be reminded of his love. I'm gonna give you just a moment of silence to reflect on that question we began with. How confident are you that God loves you? And let his spirit speak to you right now in this moment as we prepare. Lord Jesus, we confess to you that we, we aren't deserving of your love. We can't earn it. And we live in a culture that tells us differently in our own hearts. Seek to distract and condemn us sometimes. But here in this moment, as we sit together in your presence, we are reminded and we praise you that in Christ there is no condemnation. And because of you, Jesus, nothing can separate us from your love. Let's take the bread out together. And Jesus took bread and night of his betrayal and broke it and passed it to his disciples and said to them, this is my body, it is given for you. Take and eat in his memory. Then after they'd eaten, Jesus poured out a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. The new covenant of grace to know that you're washed clean, forgiven and free in his love. Let's drink together. Amen. You know, as we're singing that song, it occurred to me, we should be praying, lead me back to the cross where your love is poured out every day of our lives. The place where we know that we know that we know that we're loved by God. Brothers and sisters, go in that knowledge that because of the cross, you are loved, forgiven, and free now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.